Thank you so much. Thanks to Roy uh, for an excellent session. And Gabby, thanks for the handover. Uh, and, and welcome to the third uh, session of this Securities uh, Finance Times Technology Symposium. This is a, a session entitled Distributive uh, Ledger Technology, Creating New Opportunities in Sec Finance and Collateral Management. I'm Bob Curry, Group Editor at uh, Securities Finance Times. Uh, and with me today, I have five experts with a very detailed uh, project-based knowledge of the uses of DLT applications uh, in SEC finance and in collateral services. Um, we'll aim to keep our, uh, our session practical and to illustrate uh, our points with multiple case studies, illustrating the advances and in innovation that this technology uh, has made available across the sector. Please do keep sending in your questions. We'll welcome the opportunity to tackle those during the session. Right, I'm going to pass straight across to my excellent panellists and ask them to introduce themselves, uh, if they would, uh, and also explain a little bit about their background uh, and their interest in, uh, uh, in distributed ledger technology. I'm going to start with Michael, Michael Brown. Very much, Bob. Uh, so I'm Michael Brown. I'm a senior associate at, at Clifford Chance, and I, I cover a wide variety of products. But... For the purposes of this panel, I guess the most important specialism is SFTs and the related infrastructure and products. Uh, I advise ISLA, ICMA, a large number of agent lenders, tri-parties, and of course, beneficial owners. And relatively recently, we've obviously been expanding that a lot to look at how DLT can be used to improve that, that infrastructure. Thank you very much, Michael. Over to you, Richard Glenn. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Um, so my name is Richard Glenn. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at HQLX. For those of you that don't know who HQLX is yet, HQLX is a financial technology firm that was founded by market practitioners and is working with strategic partners and investors to build our, our vision to be the distributed ledger for securities, finance and repo. Our okay. industry has long been recognised as an integral co contributor to financial stability objectives and the ability to access and exchange HQLA has never been more important. And at HQLX, we see a genuine and exciting opportunity in deploying DLT to improve collateral mobility across tri-party agents and custodians in Europe, which in turn will help to reduce intraday liquidity and capital consumption for global banks. Thanks, Richard. Sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit there. Not a problem, sir. Uh, across to Michelle Hillary of DTCC. Thank you, Michelle. Yes. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having us here. My name is Michelle Hillary. I'm the general manager for DTCC Equity Clearing and Settlement Products. Um, interest in SFT and DLT are sort of combined in, in approvals that are going to happen in the next couple of months. DTCC is rolling out its securities financing product in the equity space. It's very akin to the sponsored repo um, program that we have over in FICC. And we are additionally about to launch our DLT platform to support clearance and settlement within the US. Thank you, Michelle. Paul Perry. Thanks, Bob. And first of all, apologies for the DJ headphones I'm wearing. But, uh, so my name is Paul Perry. I'm based in Luxembourg, and uh, I'm one of the uh, product managers for our cultural services business at JP Morgan. Uh, I'm also leading our digital strategy across trading services, and that brings me into the, the scope of DLT. Uh, and we, while we recognise there's a huge amount of risk, volatility, and, and scepticism around cryptocurrencies, I think the benefits of the underlying technology are undeniable. Um, and really, I think that's where we're focusing and, and our focus primarily for the short term is on you know, increasing the use, leveraging DLT to increase the collateral velocity and mobility, uh, particularly in our agency business. Thank you, Paul. You wear the headphones very well. <laughs> uh, last and certainly not least, over to OCC and Matt Wolf. Thanks, Bob, and to uh, Security Finance Times for bringing us together today. Uh, my name is Matt Wolf. I am an executive director of clearing systems at OCC, currently helping lead the replacement of all of our clearing systems, which includes uh, a DLT-based stock loan platform, um, which just for a frame of reference would, uh, once live, currently would uh, carry a notional value every day of $135 billion. Thanks, Matt. Excellent. Just as very brief background, many of you will be familiar with, with DLT, but in its simplest terms, we can think of distributive ledger technology as basically a decentralized record or ledger managed by multiple participants. The technology enables each participant essentially to have a direct view into the common record 
uh, and to see their positions in real time, ensuring that everybody's working from the same ledger or, or, or golden copy as the other key parties to the trade or contract. Entries to the ledger are recorded and timestamped, providing a clear record of what happened, when it happened, and who updated the record last. And when the transaction is verified, in essence, the record should be permanent and immutable. As I think a couple of panellists have indicated, I think for the most part in our session, we're talking about permission blockchain, where past participants are approved before they can access the ledger. And not for the most part are we talking about public or permissionless blockchain, which aims to be fully decentralised and may allow anyone to join. If that's not the case, I'm sure participants will uh, update you and share that with you as they're speaking. But let's get down to some uh, some practical details and some nitty gritty and get our teeth into some of these points that we, we, we've talked about in our agenda. I'm going to start with, with, with Matt and Michelle in that order, and I'm going to ask you to share a little bit about some of the project work you've been doing. What benefits in terms of processing efficiency and risk management does distributed ledger technology bring to you in the securities finance area? Matt, I know you've been working on, uh, uh, on your securities lending system. How are you applying this stuff in a practical context? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, when we first uh, said about this, you know, we went and interviewed all of our clearing members to see kind of where were their greatest pain points as it related to um, back office processing and clearing. And we heard loud and clear that the daily reconciliation challenges of um, re reconciling between lender and borrower was by far their biggest pain point. So uh, that was a great uh, way to start looking at DLT as we replaced our legacy system, um, you know, we uh, saw that it was a great opportunity for OCC to get some experience in the space and at the same time uh, provide a low cost way for, you know, our 80 ish clearing members to take a note and experiment with it themselves. Uh, the other thing that the system is looking to support is there's a, tr a transition we're seeing in the market away from these batch based processes uh, to a more real time activity, you know, 10 C1 especially pushing for that. Um, so obviously DLT provides a great way of, you know, constantly being able to see and use that um, shared golden record. Um, and actually, aside from solving uh, industry-wide problems, in the process of talking with members, we're actually finding that this technology can actually help them solve internal problems as well. You know, so they'll have a trading system, a billing system, a treasury system, you know, a custody system, a, you know, <laughs> back office system. And it's hard to keep all of those in sync together, even just within their internal systems. So they're finding that by um, taking a node which feeds event-based messages and sending that into a Kafka cluster that synchronizes all of those internal systems uh, is actually going to be quite beneficial. Uh, yes, yeah, those, those are the highlights, I would say. That's perfect. Let's uh, let's uh, leave it there, and we'll get our teeth into some of those uh, some of those interesting points shortly. Michelle, DCCC is doing some interesting stuff in the sec finance space, uh, and also more broadly, you've got some big DLT based projects going on in the background. I mean, we don't really go too much into those, given it's a sec finance based uh, um, session today. But Project Iron, Project Whitney, you know, are clearly big uh, big points in your development um, development roster. I'm asking the same question to you, uh, really. I mean, where does DLT fit into your development uh, agenda in terms of building your your your, your sec finance? Uh, solutions and offerings? Yeah, so I, I think I would largely echo, you know, the points that Matt just brought out. You know, from our perspective, we think it's a huge opportunity to drive, or, you know, operational efficiency down into our clients. One of the things that we're noticing um, or know of 
is, you know, the, this notion of reconciliation. So having like being able to embed this within the the client systems is, is obviously a huge win. I think the other part of it, though, that sort of ties into that is when you think of all, all that DTCC do, does, SEC processing is one part of it. And SEC processing in everybody's organization is one part of their overall system. You know, so why are you doing a SEC lending trade? Often it's to offset, you know, say, let's say a short in the cash side. Within the the environment that we support, um, there are multiple record types. There are multiple, you know, we have Swift in some spots. We have proprietary in other spots. We have Fix in other spots. I think the other part of this is creating this common interface, um, not just from a, an integration into your systems, but just from a formats point of view. It allows you to eliminate a lot of the um, operational inefficiency associated with all of these multiple different formats. Okay. So, you know, we're looking at it as, um, we're looking at it as a, as a really a drive towards operational efficiency as well as time efficiency for, for our clients. Michelle, that's superb. Thanks very much. I'm going to come to Paul and Richard now in that order. And I, again, I, it's a similar question, but but Paul first. I mean, Paul, DLT is basically a tool. It's a bit of technology. And you guys basically are in the business of selling solutions. You're not basically in the business of selling tools. Could we just look a little bit more at um, – the, the use cases you've tackled, the, the the client requirements and the pain points that you've been able to tackle by applying uh, DLT. I mean, I know that JP since 2020 has had this big project on X. Uh, it's Ethereum-based book of solutions that, that sits in the broader realm beyond what you manage in collateral mm-hmm. solutions. What use cases have you been tackling through this uh, through this technology? Thanks, Bob. Well, I think the, the first thing to mention is that they're one of the great things about this panel that I hope the audience realized is that we're not really talking theoretically here. We're, you know, everyone on this panel has a live DLT application uh, you know, that's up and running and uh, delivering the benefits to their respective business lines. So you know, that means that we're not looking out into the future and thinking about what might happen. We're, you know, we're all these institutions are concretely delivering products to their clients. So you know, within JP Morgan, we're we're a little bit privileged because, as you said, we have a, a pretty pretty well established private permission blockchain uh, in the form of our Onyx business unit, and that allows us effectively to to see it as a an operating system on which we can we and the different business lines can develop our own applications. So it it, it means we can we can be pretty quick to market, uh, and obviously we work with our clients and industry experts. But one of the things I do want to mention before I go into the the, the a couple of examples is that yeah you know, we especially when it comes to DLT, we don't like to operate as an island. Um, you know, the, the, the danger of creating frag- fragmented siloed solutions is, is very real. And so I think particularly around new technologies, you know, collaboration with, you know, with market participants, even competitors, peers, clients, fintechs, you know, is very important. Um, and certainly that's, that's what we're doing uh, in, internally at JP Morgan. But just as a couple of concrete examples, um, I'm sure you've all heard of, of JP Morgan Coin, uh, which is very clearly not a cryptocurrency, not a stable coin. It is literally a tokenized represent- representation of cash that you have in your, your account at JP Morgan. But what it does do is it, by tokenizing the cash, it enables you to much more rapidly move money around between um, you know, institutional commercial bank clients. So it creates efficiencies in the tokenized form of cash without having to rely on the cash market. So very, very straightforward. Then if we look at intraday repo, which for various reasons we're now calling DLT repo because it's not only intraday any longer. But the driver behind that was to say that there's a lot of unsecured intraday funding happening at the moment. How do we secure that and therefore make capital savings to both the the, um, provider of the cash and and the receiver? And so we looked at traditional repo to see that's the, the first point of call. I mean, normally you can just do it through repo, you exchange the cash against collateral, and you secure your financing. The traditional repo is very, very difficult to move into, into an intraday basis. So we looked into with, with our Onyx business unit and managed to develop a, an intraday repo product where you can tokenize. It's very simple. You tokenize collateral within certain eligibility criteria against your tokenized cash in the form of JP Morgan coin. And using blockchain, you can simultaneously exchange them, eliminating any counterparty or you know, intraday credit exposure in terms of that transaction. So very real use case, 
it, this is being used in production every day for intraday funding and um, it's a, a real world solution. Once you've built to these, uh, I call them MVPs, we quickly realized that there are multiple other applications where the, a broader market can benefit, which is why we're now converting this into what we call DLT repo, because it's moving into term, it's moving cross currency and becoming a real financing tool for the market. The, the final example is something which is on the verge of, of production. And this is uh, what we call our tokenized collateral network. And this is one of our short-term focuses where we're really looking to, if you like, increase the velocity of collateral. So when you look at, and we'll speak a bit later on about you know, the hybrid world of digital versus traditional assets, et cetera. Here, we think there are a lot of opportunities for, for um, DLT to play a role. Um, and I think, you know, also in collaboration with, particularly with HQLX, I have to say, you know, we believe that there shouldn't just be a single solution, there should be multiple solutions. And this is where connectivity becomes important. I, I won't um, talk any more about that because I think we'll get into that a bit later. But um, yeah, there's a lot of applications still in the pipeline. Um, I don't think we don't want to spread ourselves too thinly. We need to be focused on what we're delivering. But these are real, real use cases with real benefits to our clients in the industry. Thank you so much, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, apologies to come into you fourth. Um, HQLX is no newcomer in this piece. I think 2017, it's uh, it, you know it started initiating its ventures, DLT-based ventures in the in the sec finance space with its collateral transformation uh, platform. Again, get your teeth into the use case, please, and explain some of the virtues that, that HQLX has been able to bring to the table using that technology. Sure. Thank you, Bob. And I guess maybe just following on from Paul, but let me just briefly give you a bit more background into the um, into the driver for what we what we're, what we're doing and what we're trying to do. So specifically, what we've been looking at is the pain points that have been created through current settlement practice and the fact that it consumes banks' uh, capital, whether that be in the form of intraday credit usage or alternatively intraday liquidity. And this is across central banks, commercial banks, custodians, and CSDs. And whilst many banks have looked to try and implement an enterprise-wide collateral solution that looks to efficiently mobilize assets under that 24-7 follow the sub model that I think the industry has been talking about for years, the fact that settlement occurs at unspecified and often imprecise times forces banks to leave buffers of collateral across fragmented locations and time zones. And that generates not only cost, but also opportunity costs uh, for firms. Now, at the same time, in the current era, there is an increasing demand for collateral across the industry. Partly that's being driven by regulatory change initiatives such as UMR, and it's also partly by increasing volatility across markets. And this means that not only is the demand for collateral increased, in particular for HQLA, but there's also a demand for increased and accelerated collateral velocity. And so many banks, and certainly those are our clients and uh, strategic partners, uh, have sought to rethink how some of those models can get them to the next level of efficiency. And this is where we believe that DLT and certainly the solutions that HQLX can, uh, can offer uh, can play an important role. And I, I guess I'll focus on three distinct areas which are applicable across a number of the different use cases which we have. Uh, firstly, um, you know, we, we all live in a world now where we expect immediate delivery of everything. And so why should collateral settlement be any different? Now, DLT enables not only for ownership transfer of securities to be done immediately, but it also allows for that ownership to be done at precise moments in time. And that specifically reduces operational risk for banks and for their clients. But it also creates, as Paul's already mentioned, new opportunities for intraday markets in both the DVD as well as the DVP space. Secondly, and I guess in terms of network decisions, banks have tended to choose to hold assets in the location that meets their requirements, whether this be driven by asset servicing or custody needs, the desire to access liquidity using triparty, or simply cost or scale efficiencies. Now, the DLC solutions such as the one that we offer builds on that existing decision-making model and allows banks to optimally manage and transfer the ownership of collateral assets held at different silos without settlement friction. And that's hugely advantageous for portfolio managers looking to generate additional yield on hard-to-fund assets, for example, as well as clients that are looking to source collateral to cover IM or VM obligations with clearinghouses or UMR counterparties. I guess finally, what we should also mention, I think this is applicable across all of the firms on this panel, is that the, the technology is an enabler itself. In the digital age where data is king and cyber resilience is on the top of every CTO's agenda, many banks have looked at the costs of maintaining the hodgepodge of legacy systems and are assessing solutions that give them transparency, 
security, and simplification at a more scalable cost. And what DLT does is efficiently drive content into vendor style, I'll use the word apps loosely, that provide real-time visibility over collateral positions. They provide a golden source of truth to reduce reconciliation efforts. I know that some of the other panelists have already mentioned that. But more importantly, it also provides an optimized data system for post-trade analytics. Now, I think the transition for these solutions for some clients is going to be harder than others, but the benefits will certainly outweigh the cost in the longer term, we think. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I appreciate that. We'll come back to some of those points. I want to sort of drill down a little bit uh, just for five minutes or so, looking a little bit more at some of the legal, the operational and the securities-based challenges you've experienced in, in putting those solutions into practice. And, and Michael, sorry for the wait, Michael Brown, uh, but uh, you, it's no surprise that I, I want to talk to you about some of the legal challenges. I mean, you've worked alongside a number of projects, potentially maybe some of the people sat on, on, on this panel. Let's just talk about some of the sort of major legal hurdles that they've been drawing on your expertise and opinion uh, in terms of putting their project uh, in, into place. I mean, we've got to deal with the, with the challenge of making what the electronic record says stand up uh, in the real world, in the real law court, you know, where have the major challenges been for you? Exactly, and and I think it's important to emphasise that the DLT covers a, a very broad church of product offerings, and so, unsurprisingly, that the key question you're going to start with whenever you're looking at the legal analysis is what is the platform, what's it trying to achieve, what does the token represent? Is it a tech tool? Is it a legal instrument in its own right? And it's only once you've really drill down into that that the other legal questions can follow on from there and obviously depending on the use case the legal questions will be different if you're looking at smart contracts you'll have completely different questions to sort of a more of an asset based question but given the discussion so far i guess it's it's better to use that as a case study so the, the questions that would flow from uh, an asset based transfer system where you're looking to make the settlement of conventional security is more efficient are going to be questions around who actually holds the, the real securities, who the securities are held for, um, what rights do platform participants enjoy and how do they get to enforce those rights, um, both against the platform and of course against each other as needed. And then of course what's the, the legal effect of updating the ledger? You also have to think quite carefully about how securities are brought onto the platform and inevitably how they come off the platform because that tends to be key to what rights people can enjoy. And once you've gone through that analysis, you, you begin to understand in a, in a fair amount of detail what exactly the platform is doing and how it's operating and, and what the legal effect of it should be. But obviously, you then have to start applying that to the regulatory framework. So you have to start asking yourself what roles parties are performing, whether or not those roles trigger any regulatory licensing requirements. I mean, the D stands for distributed, so you have to start analysing which jurisdictions are relevant for that analysis. And, and then you have the, the mental hurdle that comes if you have more than one jurisdiction and they have different answers. That might take you back to the first set of questions. And it's easy to see Paul, Paul everybody nodding, so they've clearly confronted the same issues. Um, that might obviously lead to you putting limitations on where the platform can operate or which parties can be onboarded onto the platform, even if only on a, on a temporary basis. And you might have to think again about those questions if a party isn't acting as a principal, because you might have to start drilling down to the underlying layer even further. I guess at that point, you now have a good sense of what the regulators would make of it, but there's still no real application until you start applying that to a contractual and operational framework that everybody's used to dealing with. So at a basic level, when you transfer a security on the platform, does that satisfy the obligation to deliver a security under your securities lending documentation or, or repo documentation? Like, have you fulfilled the basic requirements of your contract? Because if not, the platform clearly needs modification or people are going to have to adjust their contracts. And as part of that, that's going to start leading into questions around whether or not reuse of the assets is permitted. If you, if you can't reuse the assets, that might be cutting across the legal analysis around whether or not you really have a transfer of title in the underlying documents that might lead people to start revisiting their netting opinions. And it's a further hurdle to the adoption of the platform. Um, you also have to start thinking through all the other aspects of the securities. So what do you do with income generated on the securities? Can people vote on securities that are held to the platform? How would they do that? And then finally, 
how does it fit into the existing operational framework? So if you need to onboard securities onto the platform, how is that operating? Are you using somebody else's existing systems? And it's important to think that through quite carefully because if you're looking to use a number of different service providers or, or underlying sub-custodians or custodians, it might well be the case that you're, you're looking to build this, the platform in a way that easily interacts with their systems because obviously the easier you make it going to use their processes, the faster they can adopt the platform. All of those questions only really solve the title transfer, but you know, people have already mentioned initial margin, but you also have pledged securities lending. And so you, you're going to have different questions if you're looking at a security-based structure. So you're going to be asking what security is granted over, where the security is granted, how the security is perfected, um, whether or not the security arrangement is a financial collateral arrangement, because again, that can be critical for the legal analysis underpinning it. And obviously how that fits into other regulatory requirements. When people talk about initial margin for the unclear margin rules, but that prompts very specific questions around what assets are eligible collateral under those rules. It also asks you to think about segregation requirements and other legal opinions that you're going to need to work through. And I guess that's that's really the sort of the sum type of legal questions you, you tend to look at in these kinds of structures. And I suppose I've done the, the traditional loyalty trick of raising questions rather than offering answers, but the nature of the technology is that every platform is different. So, sorry, Paul, <laughs> you can you can immediately see that you are going to be asking these questions every time and your answers won't necessarily be the same. Michael, that's super. Quick uh, opportunity, a quick um, opportunity for response, uh, if anybody wishes to at this point. I mean, Michael has articulated those points very well through a legal practitioner's eyes. What is the, uh, you know, is, is there a specific points you wish to add from a, from a technology and a solutions practitioner's uh, standpoint uh, in terms of engaging with what Michael's just uh, highlighted? Yeah, Bob, maybe I can add something in there in that the, a lot of what um, what has just been said is is absolutely critical. I mean, the technology is there. We we, you know, we, we know it works. Uh, we've proven it. Um, technically, we can deliver things very quickly. But the legal and regulatory framework is, is not to be underestimated. Um, we have limited regulation around DLT. It's, it's more and more coming, uh, some better than others. But the the key thing, especially when we're talking about collateral, and this is relevant whether it's you know it's a CCP or if it's a bilateral trade, tri-party, whatever, is the receiver has to have that absolute certainty in the event of default that they they have ownership or they have a security interest in the asset that they can enforce in the relevant court of law. And if we don't have that certainty, then this doesn't fly at all. So yeah, what that what has just been mentioned just it can't be underestimated in any of the solutions that we're delivering. It, it's critical. Thank yeah, you. Correct. I will maybe, I'll maybe just add on to that. It is it's all about control risks. A lot of the DLT solutions that are being introduced are there to replace some of the interoperable proprietary databases that banks and clients have. And so therefore, as well as in addressing some of the uh, the legal and, and jurisdictional regulatory points, it's also having security over the data. Is the data that you're seeing correct? Can I trust it? But then to Paul's point in terms of event of default, yeah, when push comes to shove, you know, banks need to know that the assets that we represent on the ledger are actually there. I just want to broaden those points a little bit. You can come back to legals as, as, as we move the discussion forward. But just in terms of project implementation, I want to talk to you just a little bit about, firstly, what sort of input and feedback have you particularly had from your DLT project partners? You know, some of you work, HQLX has worked quite closely with R3. Uh, Onyx is a Ethereum-based uh, suite. I, I think DTC has done quite a lot uh, with, with Hyperledger amongst others. Um, um, Matt's working with, with, with Axion at, uh, at OCC. Um, what's the main input that you've received, the main guidance that you've received from your, your, your DLT project partners in shaping your implementations? Matt, I can well, see you I'll moving. I'll uh, take a stab at that one. Um, when we, you know, first looked at starting this project, you know, we didn't have any in-house uh, experience with working with building DLT-based systems. Uh, so, you know, it was really important that uh, we found the right technology partner uh, to, to, to help work together with us to embed um, our own internal uh, experience. So, uh, you know, we looked at a number of different uh, vendors that were around in 
2018, 19. Um, and yeah, we, we found that Axani um, was the right balance of uh, technology as well as uh, financial uh, knowledge. So uh, what we did is we formed a team of developers at OCC and a similar team over at uh, Axani, and they're actually working together as a single team uh, co-developing the system. Uh, and you know, we learn from them and they learn from us uh, every day. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, Michelle, do I push that one in your direction? I want to broaden it. What did you learn from your tech partners, but also, you know, what input have you been receiving, of course, from your clients in shaping project development integral to any IT build? Yeah, so I, I think you actually have to start up way up front, right? We Somebody mentioned, I think it was Paul earlier, um, this notion of fragmentation across the market and how do we sort of not create a super fragmented market with everybody operating a different system. So one of the things that DTCC has created is this framework for analyzing the various different um, platforms that are out there and trying to say which one is the right one for, for the use case that we're trying to present. Um, I think that what that's doing is creating a very deliberate sort of path forward for choosing the right DLT platform for the right business use case. In many cases, that's conforming around the same thing, since many business lines within DTCC tend to do the same thing. However, it is a very deliberate and very sort of pragmatic approach to saying, how am I finding the right platform for the right solution? In the case of um, the, the, the rollout we're about to have in, in the near-term project ION, um, we've, you know, we, we ran a number of, of platforms through this framework and we ended up using, settling on using Corda R3 for, for Project Aya. It's not in production yet. It's, uh, the MVP is being, is anticipated to be launched in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think though what, you know, the interaction with Corda has been a very positive. It's a, it's a, obviously a development relationship. It's a partnership. Um, and we're trying, we're doing this together. I think though, encircling it back to sort of the conversation we just had about the legal and regulatory, I want to take that from a slightly different angle, because one of the things that we had to work very closely with our provider for is how do we satisfy a CIFMU's requirements around things like resiliency, scalability, and security. Um, and so a lot of the conversation with our partner has been in ensuring that we deliver that because as CCP, you know, the trust that's embedded in a CCP and the trust and the resiliency and the reliability that you demand from us and that we expect to deliver to you, I think is critical to our ongoing success. So I think that that's one of the areas I would highlight as being a very key conversation to have with your with your development partner. Perfect. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we're 35 minutes in, amazingly, to our session, so I want to keep this moving a little bit. And in fact, I am, you know, to move our, our discussion forward, we're going to come to, you know, a question which potentially we would perhaps, you know, look to towards uh, towards the end of our um, our session, and that is the question of what does the collateral ecosystem of the future look like? And I'm going to get. Paul to kick off on that but Paul if you'll excuse me we've just got an audience question that's come in that's kind of slightly aligned from that so if we can just take this audience question very quickly first and then I'm going to uh, pass across to look at that broader agenda there is a question do you think tokenization of stocks will be the future of buying and selling stocks in the DeFi world and how will this help to transform securities finance so really it's a question on on tokenization now I don't want to force us I mean uh, Richard, you do a bit of tokenization at uh, at HQIAX, um, you know, from a slightly different standpoint. Uh, who wants to take that 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 audience question? I, I can kick off, Bob, if you like. It, cool. I think one of one of the the key points to understand here is that when we talk about the the, the type of digital assets that that can be um, that can rely on DLT technology, you've got a massive range and i'm not just talking about you know, stable coins and cryptocurrencies and the algorithms that sit underneath their investments which have caused them the mess that the market's in at the moment but much more about tokenization and, and when you know, richard in hqlx and and some of the work that we're doing when we're talking about tokenization we are deliberately avoiding creating a new transferable security we are creating a digital representation of ownership of the underlying but i, I think this question is is more talking about 
creating liquidity through tokenization by by effectively creating a, a secondary market in tokenized assets. So here we could be, let's say, for example, you have a, a building that you, you represent in tokenized form. You break that up into small enough components that you can sell bits of that building without actually selling the building. So you can create liquidity in, in a fixed asset that has no liquidity. And, and, and that, I, I think, is very, very powerful. But that is a longer term uh, concept. It, it's something that um, um, would be great. I mean, JP Morgan owns a number of buildings and so do to many institutions. And if we could use, start to use those as collateral, then then you know it would be a, a, a great uh, invention or innovation. But yeah, that's far away. So I think the in answer to the question, yes, ultimately, I think digital assets and, and tokenization in particular will create more liquidity, um, will enable execution in, in new secondary markets. But I think it's it's further away. And right now, tokenization is going to be a very important tool in helping clients to manage hybrid portfolios and to create you know, increased liquidity and, and mobility in their traditional assets. So as they move more and more into the natively digital bonds and perhaps some of the crypto assets, you know, and they combine those in a portfolio, they've got to be able to manage that traditional versus um, digital world and tokenization can kind of bridge that gap. Thank you, Paul. Well, can I add on here just a little bit um, on the first part of the question? I think that we have to be a little bit realistic about where we are in the maturity of DLT right now. So I agree with you, Paul. I think I think tokenization and re-representation of securities as they as they you know they, they they weren't natively issued that way. I think is the way we're going to see things evolve. But if we're talking about true selling and buying of securities, just on the cash market as an example. Um, I don't think the technology is at a level of maturity now where it can actually support that levels of volume. That's not to say it can't in the future. Um, but if you look at the U.S. cash market right now, just on the sell side, you're talking about 200 million to 300 million sides of transactions a day with peak volumes at the start and the end of the day of about 15,000 transactions a second on a peak day, you know, an average of about 25,000. That DLT is not ripe to be able to process that in real time um, even just from even if the, if we have an extended settlement cycle, just the processing and the you know the the complete manpower of representing that uh, you know appropriately on a DLT, we are we are quite far away from that. I would say. Um, so I think you, you know the the pure buying and selling of assets um, in that world um, for the mass of the market is is probably quite a di you know somewhat in the distant future. I think you know if we're talking about re natively issued when we get there um, in segments of the market, I think that's a, di a different part of the conversation. Um, but it, you know I I, I just want to be honest to the truth of the maturity of the technology and the speed that it can operate at this point in time. So the current focus has essentially been on quite illiquid asset classes that can be fractionalized and traded in smaller denominations by that fact, rather than sort of highly liquid cash securities type um, securities at this stage in our development. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think I think Bob, maybe just picking up on that. So I know, I mean, the term tokenization, I think it gets broadly used to and interpreted to be a number of different things. So I think Paul's response in terms of highlighting the difference between a digital representation of an asset on a ledger versus a tokenization. You know, there is some genuine legal and regulatory difference between the two. And I think it's important that certainly the, uh, you know, our role is in educating the market is making sure that people do understand the risks and, and benefits of the two. But to that point, certainly the technology will move in that direction. It's just a question of when. You're talking, Richard, about a reference security that refers to an underlying asset. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let's just go back to our, our map, please. Um, I just think it, it is worth mentioning this isn't uh, necessarily a future question. I mean, Paxos today is tokenizing securities and trading them. Now, you know, Michelle's point was um, very, very valid. It's a much smaller market and whether that would could support uh, an entire <laughs> the entire equities market is questionable. But um, to the point about natively issuing on-chain, that I think is a really important question. And um, what we wouldn't want to see is markets becoming fragmented where there's, you know, one set of one market trading the traditional security and a separate market trading the um, 
on-chain security with different prices for the exact same instrument. So as an industry, we'll need to think closely about how that rollout occurs in the future. Thank you. That's true. And, and I was just going to add that I think in addition to the tech environment, obviously needing to evolve to make some of these things possible, I think the legal and regulatory environment needs to evolve as well. You know, so at, at this point, they wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily achieve a broad legal consensus or, or un, uniform regulatory requirements in respect of native assets. And I think that's quite an important point because if this is innovative technology and and it's not just enough to have a good answer as to why something works. You, you need to convince quite a lot of your peers in order to have a viable platform. So I, I think as the regulatory and, and legal landscape evolves, I think it will make it easier to see sort of into the future as, as Paul predicted. Perfect. Let's keep that those those points in mind. And you know, let's come back to that broader overarching question of what the, the collateral ecosystem of the future does look like. Um Paul, can I push that in your direction for first crack, and then we can we can widen it across our panel? Sure, Bob. I, I, I don't think anyone can can say exactly what the well. No, put it a different way. I don't think there is an end state. I think what we what we're going through now is a kind of not quite the same, but similar to the transition from you know, the old bearer bonds into a dematerialized security. We're going through another type of transition like that, and I think. Um, a lot of the points that have just been mentioned, you know, fragmentation and the speed of change and things like that, these are all very, very relevant in the, you know, the regulatory landscape. And I think on all of those, you know, I, I kind of look at this as a um, a very long path that we're on. People are you know, joining at different junctions. There's multiple lanes. But as long as we're all on that same path, we've got to basically we're going to be all together building out that the road in front of us. And I think um, as long as we don't divert from each other and go off on our own different paths and create this fragmentation, then I think it's going to be you know, a, a kind of continuous, continuously developing process. Uh, and everyone has mentioned this, this interoperability and connectivity. Um, and I think you know, within um, HQLX, there's the, the trusted third party role. And within some of the, the applications that we're building, we have what we call our collateral token agent, which is a connectivity layer. And there are many, many um, technology solutions out there at the moment that are aiming to bridge the connectivity and create shared wallets between blockchains. It, it's, a, it's a big challenge, carries with it significant risk as well. But I think one of the, the components here and is that larger in, institutions can support the smaller fintechs, not just through collaboration and investment, but also by kind of maybe the wrong words but sort of putting our arms around it to say we'll we'll take that risk because you have the technology so you become basically a software provider um, but we will leverage that technology and we'll cover that risk that's inherent in the volumes of trades that were flowing through it and and that can can help to bridge these gaps uh, and you know certainly Jake Morgan is very conscious of as I said before not building things in silo um, we don't want we want competition yeah, we want collaboration, um, and I think that that's very important. The the other point I wanted to mention is is the speed of change. You know, I think we see it all around us at the moment. Our industry is probably one of the slowest moving. Some of it is to do with the lack of regulation, the lack of um, uh, you know, maybe um, industry driven legal opinions that we can apply to the underlying documentation, etc. But I think the speed of change is accelerating. And one of the challenges that we have, uh, and I speak on behalf of the whole panel here, in, in kind of leading this industry is if we force our clients to have to adopt completely new operating models in order to connect in and leverage our products, then it, it's a very painful process for them on top of everything that we've just, you know, all the challenges we've been discussing. So you know, one of the things that, that we've had to do is to make sure that whatever we, we build can almost seamlessly drop into the existing flows of our operating flows of our clients um, and that can be sometimes a bit going against the technology so you know we were looking at obviously at, at data lakes and apis and uh, you know this this idea of um, the cdms you know the common domain model etc to standardize and normalize data and data lakes where everyone can can access that, that what they want and then you have clients who say no but i only want to receive a swift or you know it, it's a certain sftp whatever it might be facts so so you know, we have to deal with that and in order to get that adoption and that critical mass and that change we have to manage that and 
And only in the longer term will you know, the likes of the APIs, et cetera, and that connectivity build out itself. And then you get the real, the real global benefits of DLT. So that, that was a bit long-winded. But. No, exactly. I think, I think we'll maybe just follow on for that. I would wholeheartedly agree it's all about marginal gains. And certainly from some of the banks and clients that we've been working with, it is about getting them comfortable that they can reconcile messaging in a way that their legacy systems can still talk to the digital world, that they appreciate that there's a, you know, a longer view towards that end state. But I guess coming back at it from um, the top-down model is that, particularly when we talk to the front office, you know, that they're, the clients of HQLX would want to make fails a thing, a thing of the past. And so it's actually then going down the journey to make sure that they can re-engineer some of that traditional back office and middle office flow that will then enhance their own experience from a front office perspective, but will then truly make that entire post-trade layer um, completely seamless. Thank you. I'll pick a, you know, a very specific securities lending um, example of the, the collateral underlying the loan. Uh, currently today, uh, we do the mark to market, but it doesn't settle until tomorrow morning or even Monday morning in the case of Fridays. Uh, that creates risk that uh, your, your counterparty who owes you collateral could um, fail to make settlement tomorrow or next weekend, which is when we have seen defaults in the past. And so I think it's really interesting to um, watch and listen to uh, what Michelle is doing with Project ION uh, to potentially have a Fed-based um, you know, token that could be used uh, as cash and actually perform that mark to market in the evening instead of the very next day. Thank you. Just picking up on those, and I'm going to put it to Michelle and Michael. I mean, presumably over time, we're moving in a direction where clients will want to use a broader spread of asset inside their collateral pool. This will you know, include traditional GC and it will in include traditional assets. It will also include you know, reference assets to a degree. And over time, it will probably include digit digitally issued assets. Where do the perils and complexities lie? And, you know, and how does that, you know, what sort of time frame are we talking about uh, in, in terms of this evolution mapping out over? So I start with Michael and ask him about some of the legal headaches and I can put it back to uh, Michelle from a practitioner's standpoint and others can chip in as, if they wish to. Sure. I mean, I think there's, um, unsurprising, there's any number of headaches. So at the moment, the by far and away, the easiest sort of structure to design is one that more closely resembles an existing structural process. So you're looking at assets that are more familiar to people. As we talked about, you're looking at platforms that people can more easily plug into. As you start to expand the range of assets that people want to take as collateral, you have new and exciting legal questions around what the asset actually is, how you would enforce against it. Like at a basic level, there's a debate about whether a cryptocurrency is cash or security or or something else entirely. And if you can't classify it, it's very difficult to persuade a lawyer to give you a robust legal on how best to take security over it or how to enforce against it. And I think that, that that's really a key point because not only as you expand the range of assets do you have new legal hurdles to face, you also have connection considerations as well because you're essentially building multiple ecosystems you want to plug together and making sure that they interrelate is is pretty key to making the entire system work the other aspect that i think is worth bearing in mind is that i think leveraging off the points earlier around you know, regulatory capital and, and how people want to make best use of their of their collateral I suspect people will increasingly want to use security arrangements as well as title transfer arrangements. You see a much more hybrid world in, in the SFT market today. So there is the published, the pledge GMSLA. ICMA haven't published a pledge GMO, but there's plenty of people doing pledge trades out there. And I think people are going to be looking to make use of that, of that kind of um, arrangement when they're applying these platforms. Thank you, Michael. Michelle, did you want to... I don't think, or we can move on and uh, I'll ask you something else. Yeah, I don't have a, a ton to, to sort of chime in on, in on this. I think I think where DTCC is, is recognizing that this is a kind of a path forward and it's a future path. 
Um, and it's certainly one that we're going to have to have detailed conversations around. But I think we're kind of in the same place as Michael outlined. It's very hard to sort of say what that path is going to form, how wide is it going to be, how narrow is it going to be, because we do have a lot of these legal questions that need to be answered. Um, so I think we're more at the stage where we're recognizing that as being a fact for the future. And then once we sort of nail some of that down, then we can actually, you know, turn that into a practical build and application against it. Thank you so much. I just want to put out to you uh, another audience question we we perceived, and that alludes to the fact that DLT is, is generating clearly a, a wave of multi-participant applications for the SEC finance industry. The, the, the questioner asks, typically institutions are facing inefficiencies owing to due diligence processes slowing down the adoption of new platforms. Um, how could the industry collaborate to help itself in that regard? So on the due diligence hindering or, 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 or slowing down um, the adoption of new DLT-based platforms. Does anyone want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll take a quick stab at that one. Um, you know, Michelle touched upon it earlier as a systemically important financial market utility. Um, the technology standards that um, we have to abide by through Reg SCI um, to operate these critical SCI systems in a production way, um, it, there's there's really uh, intense uh, non-functional requirements that the systems must meet, and uh, you know so we're we're in the process of working with the SEC and the Fed on um, uh, an advance notice filing. To, to educate them about how the DLT system works, um, how it's similar and potentially different from existing systems. Uh, and so I think through, you know, these, these um, regulatory approvals that will help um, clear some of the due diligence, at least from a legal perspective uh, for the industry. Thank you, Matt. We're critically short on time now, so I'm going to really ask for your your closing comments and there's a question i do want to ask you and i'm not really not going to give you much more than a minute what are the next steps on your development agenda basically employing dlt but where will your dlt where will, will your dlt journey sit in three years time so i'm going to start with richard please where will you be in three years time richard thank you bob um so i guess in three years time and looking at that timeline um i mean we remain focused on the pathways to scale for the use cases we've mentioned, whether that be securities lending, collateral upgrades and downgrades, short covering. Um, we're also looking at delivering end state models that will facilitate ownership of uh, ownership transfer of securities at precise moments in time. Um, if anything, we also see the development, as Paul's alluded to, not only intraday, but interday repo across a number of collateral products. We think that's uh, a development that the market will embrace. And among other things, we'll just keep listening to clients. And um, if there's things that clients want us to build, then let's do that. Thanks so much, Richard. I'm going to move straight to Paul. So I, I can I can take a, carry on exactly from where Richard left off. Um, uh, you know, we need to listen to our clients. Those are the ones who who, who pay our wages. Um, however, if we built everything a client wanted us to build, we'd be dead. So. What we the approach we're taking in the very short term is we believe we've got a foundation in our the DLT products we we have uh, live, and now we need to you know, build them out uh, over the next next twelve months, in conjunction with our clients. So what we've done is we've we've defined a, a roadmap and we'll basically fine tune that with our clients, um, in order to you know, identify which are their priorities, and in doing so we're going to do it with groups of clients, and we believe that that method which we've proven works before means that there'll be concrete business behind the the, the um and not commitment but the priorities they have therefore as you deliver to their priorities you know that those volumes will naturally come on board and that way you can build up scale in your in your product over that, that period so that's i guess our short-term goal and i think just very quickly on slightly longer out maybe over over two to three years i think not only are we going to get scale in the in the tokenized collateral space and which will change the way that we handle securities financing but i think we'll have new participants that come into that um, and this is when i say new participants but i mean completely new providers and consumers of collateral who were not in our space at all at the moment and i won't say any more about that but i think if you 
if the audience pays attention to the next uh, eight weeks of conferences that are happening around, I think we'll see you know, some new participants at some of those conferences that will um, shortly be playing in our space. Thanks, Paul. I need to move on to Michelle and then I'm going to come to, to Matt and I'm going to give Michael the final word. Michelle, please. Yeah, sure. I think over the next three years, DTCC's goal is certainly to expand our minimum viable product across the, the DTC ecosystem, but to do so in a way not just where it's, you know, supporting the existing set of um, of assets that DTCC, you know, you know, clears and settles. But in addition to that, making sure that as the markets are emerging um, and, and changing and, uh, and evolving, that the technology that we've built can support those evolutions. I think we, we view this as a, a real tool towards business expansion, your business expansion and our support of that business expansion. So I think that's a critical part for us. So it kind of goes back to that what do the clients need kind of conversation again. Perfect, thanks. Um, Matt Wolf, OCC. Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess three years from now, um, I would forecast that we're in production operating this DLT-based uh, securities lending platform with a number of um, participants taking notes and uh, exploring the benefits of doing such. And uh, we'll also be looking to Michelle's point about uh, expanding our services as well as our products that are offered on the platform. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Michael, you've got about uh, just over, well, a minute and a little bit. Um, three years' time, but also what's your main takeaway from the panel? So I think uh, over the next few years, we're going to see a steady increase in the number of use cases and products being offered on platform. And, and hopefully we'll also see platforms being able to link together as efficiently as possible. I mean, in, in reality, once assets are on platform, the most inefficient process is usually taking them on or taking them off because that relies on conventional security settlements. And obviously that's that's what we're all looking to improve. So I, I suspect that just the natural rollout of that is going to be uh, the the process for the next few years. I guess in, in the very long term, I'm hoping to be giving answers rather than raising questions, but uh, the last few years of my legal career suggest that that's, that's probably an ambition too far, but it would be nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all our panelists. I think you've done a fantastic job. I'm very pleased how much sort of case study based um, insight you're able to provide there as well as a, a very useful forward looking uh, view into the future. So thanks so much for your efforts and particularly thanks to the audience for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon, this morning or, or wherever you are in the world. And now I'm going to uh, pass back to my good friend Gavi. This is a new concept. It's based on um, securities finance market feedback. If you're spinning up a new business line or changing the target operating model, considering replacement of a legacy system, or if you're a smaller or niche market participant seeking a more optimal securities finance platform than you have today. Now, in all cases, the desire is a rapid technology cost benefit and ROI. It's a lower financial entry point a means of increasing securities finance efficiency and profits in line with global uh, current conditions, tighter balance sheet and budget constraints. Hence the term fast start. Now conceptually to do this, we consider one question. Um, are your needs complex? Now, if the answer is no, then SSCM fast starts designed to be fit for purpose off the shelf, as is for a considerable period of time. If the answer is maybe, yes, and then Fast Start would be the live, clean platform you need to focus on refining your target operating model and using SFCM to reduce complexity, especially uh, maybe in conjunction with Broadridge's consulting practice, where our experts can assist you in that evaluation. Fast Start is based on the full SFCM securities finance platform, but we're able to offer it at a really attractive price point and spin it up quickly because it's a smaller base set of modules. Uh, it's SaaS hosted and it has an effective means for data management whilst reducing the need for first phase integration. In other words, it's a means of getting you started and it's ready off the shelf for securities lending and repo trading and ops front to back. It's really simple to start, take a look, uh, sign up, and within two weeks, you'll be on SFCM Fast Start and you will be performing your training. Uh, we offer great terms, especially during the initial months. So if you need to exit Fast Start, you can. However, if 
SFCM fast start meets expectations out of the box, then you can continue using it as is. Or as your business grows, you can scale it up, adding modules, automation and integration as the needs and budget uh, allow. Now, if this idea SFCM fast start piques your interest, then give me a call. Uh, we'd be only too happy to discuss how it could help your business. How can you initiate a process of change in your company in a way that's both fast and controlled? Where fast execution and excellence are no longer just a challenge, but a requirement? At Vermeg, this is what we have been offering our customers every day for over 25 years. Technological excellence through software solutions to accelerate and control your digital transformation. We are a leading technology provider to the banking and insurance sector. Every day, thanks to our solutions, we support you to meet the challenges of your digital transformation for more connectivity, agility and security. Today, Vermeg's integrated platform allows you to adapt to increasingly complex and evolving challenges through the client experience, oriented and innovative solutions centered on data in accordance with current regulations and through development tools to accelerate the implementation of high added value projects. We are more than 1,000 collaborators, driven by the same passion and the same vision. Software leaders in finance to accelerate your digital transformation.